in this year's uh, season of Talking Art in Maine, Intimate Conversations. Uh, I'm Andrew Fenneman, the executive director here. I cannot believe we've actually almost completed another season. It's, it's amazing. And so before introducing our guests, I just wanted to do a couple of things. First off, I'd like us to actually to thank our host, Jane, because Jane works so hard on these things. I don't think people realize the, the amount of time she spends learning and scrutinizing and thinking, God, what's the best question I could ask? And, and Andrew, could we move that slide like too earlier because I think it'd be better there. And, and she works incredibly hard to make these happen. And I think, and this is the third year we've done this? Is that since right? Since 2013. Holy cow, since 2013 yeah, wow. that we've been doing this. So before we start, I'd like to ask you to please give Jane a round of applause. <laughs> Secondly, I'm pleased to say Jane has agreed to come back and do another series next year. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a great thing. Um, so before we start, the other thing I'd say is we need to thank our sponsors. There are three sponsors of this series. One is H.M. Payson, based right here in Damariscada and in Portland. Also, um, Art Collector Maine and Maine Home and Design Magazine. And there are copies of the magazine in the lobby. If you'd like to take them, feel free to do so, but please help yourself. So a round of applause, please, for our sponsors. Right. And for those of you that may know or not know about the lovely historical Lincoln Theater, um, we've been redoing our windows. So you'll see a little bit of light coming over them because on Monday and Tuesday of this week, um, we'll have the shades and screens put in, but the original 1875 windows in the auditorium have now been completely restored. Yeah. Nice. It's incredibly exciting. And so I would just invite you that on Tuesday, June 20th, we're going to have from 4 to 6 a reception here in the theater. Uh, free champagne, bubbly, popcorn, uh, to play with the windows. And, and literally and figuratively open the windows. So we we'll hope you'll come and get a chance to see what it's like when the sun comes in. And it's this beautiful original brocade fabric that are on the walls. It's just so exciting. So I just would like to invite you all to come join us for that. But keep an eye out in the paper, and we'll make sure that you hear about it. So enough about me. Thank you for being here tonight. And I will now turn it over to Jane and let her introduce our guests for the evening. So thank you for coming to Talking Out in Maine, Intimate Conversations. Thank you, Andrew. And I want to thank you. I think we you deserve a hand for all you're doing here. So this is you. Well, welcome to Talking Art in Maine. I'm your host, Jane Damon. I'm an artist from Newcastle. Tonight, we welcome two young sculptors who are making waves both in Maine and beyond. Uh, if you've been up to the Farnsworth Museum in the last three years, you've seen two of Jesse's beautiful sculptures out on the lawn. I think he showed at the Botanical Gardens some work. And if you're arriving in Maine at the Jet Port and you come to the arrival area and you walk out of that door, look to your left. Is it on the left or the right? It's the left. And you will see Jesse's 14-foot granite sculpture titled Moon, welcoming you to Maine. I love it. And there are three other sculptures on, uh, on the Jet Port grounds also. And they just told me today that Toshi, Hoshi and Jesse uh, installed one of Hoshi's uh, sculptures at the University of Maine in Orono. So they are on a roll. And I want you to look at their work because I know you're going to see it a lot more in the future. Um, Katsumi Hoshino, or Hoshi, was born in 1973 in Nagoya, Japan, the third largest incorporated city in Japan and a populist urban area. She studied oil painting and sculpture privately before attending Tohoku University of Art and Design, where she graduated with a degree in sculpture. In 2004, she participated in the Nasuno, no, Nasuno Gahara International Sculpture Symposium, where she and Jesse Salisbury met. They married two years later in Kyoto, Kyoto, Japan, and moved to rural Steuben, Maine, Jesse's hometown. Living close to nature has had an effect on Hoshi's work. She works in local granite and basalt, carving sculptures of deceptive simplicity, which invite contemplation and infinite interpretation. She focuses on elegant, 
intimate shapes which emphasize the natural beauty of the stone. When Jesse Salisbury grew up in, on the rock-bound coast in Steuben, Maine, he was influenced at an early age by the geology of the area. While only 12 years old, he was already working with professional artist Peter Weil, carving wood after school. In his teens, his family moved to Japan, where Jesse completed high school, becoming fluent in Japanese. After graduating from Colby College as an East Asian Studies major with a double minor in Chinese and art, and then studying at the Art Students League in New York City, he returned to Japan to work with sculptors Katsumi Aida and Atsu Atsuo Okamoto. Sorry, Jesse. Yeah. In 2004, he met Hoshi and they married in 2006. Jesse has brought other sculptures from around the world to Maine in symposia that he himself has organized. In fact, in 2004, he organized a symposium at the uh, Round Top Center for the Arts right here in Damascata. And then in 2007, he again held the Scudic International Sculpture Symposium in Acadia National Park. Jesse built his studio on family land in Steuben, Maine, assembling the tools and equipment he and Hoshi need to follow their passion. Jesse's love of splitting stone and creating sculpture that brings out the 350 million year old granite, inherent movement, raw power, and natural energy belies our preconceived notions about what is possible with stone. Jesse and Hoshi, welcome to Talking Art in Maine. Um, I want to begin just to ask you to each comment, if you can, on some of the challenges and benefits of both working under the same roof, the, doing the same artwork, art form, and, while parenting two children. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm asking what are some of the challenges and benefits of both of you doing the same art form, sculpture, under the same roof while parenting two children? That's got to be a challenge. Yes, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse? Well, I mean, the benefits are that we kind of encourage each other's artwork. Um, we understand why we want to do it, so you don't have to justify why you're doing that. Um, I think there's challenges to being married to anybody, whether you're both artists or not. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure if it, if it makes it easier or harder. It's, it's probably a combination. Um, having two kids in rural Maine, is, is a lot of fun anyway, because you kind of get to re-experience nature again through the eyes of, of kids. Um, and of course, being in kind of a remote area, having a whole, a, a, I wouldn't say a large family, but medium-sized family is, is nice. Um, of course, we work right at our, our studios built behind our house. Um, so we're, we're they, not only, do we live together, work together, but it's all, all right in the same area. Um, so fortunately, it's a little walk away from the house. <laughs> a little bit of separation. Well, you have said you don't compete, but rather you push each other to do your best work. And I know as an artist, I can say that every artist craves this kind of direction from somebody who you respect, who's an artist, who comes and says, I think you should move in this direction and maybe not in that direction, at least gives you some feedback that, from someone you respect. So I think that's great. Yeah, we certainly do do that. Yeah. Have you influenced each other artistically, do you think? <laughs> um, well, Hoshi has, uh, I don't want to call it necessarily a Japanese sense of detail, but I think it is partly that. Um, you know, real attention to the finished detail. And I think in some ways, but my early sculptures were much more dynamic and, and bold. So Hoshi's kind of fanatical sense of detail um, encourages me to 
put the detail in my own work also. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Your work is both, it's very different, but uh, it's interesting to, to hear how it might influence, you might influence each other. Well, what the format is gonna be is we'll look at some of Hoshi's work and process first, and then we'll do the same with Jesse, and after that we'll open the floor to questions. So, uh, I guess I have to do this, don't I? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, I wanna back up. That is uh, Jesse and... I can tell you about it. Yeah, you tell us. Uh, Hoshi and I, we're gonna get into this later too, but for the past two years, We've been living on uh, Kitagi Island, which is in the Inland Sea of Japan, for several months um, in the wintertime. And Kitagi Island is sort of like the vinyl haven of Japan. They've been quarrying stone since the castle building era of 1600. And it was a huge industry up through the 1980s and 90s. And it's, um, it's sort of like a declined factory town on islands now. So we use the, um, the, the factory spaces there, and also to explore the island. These two stones were stacked there in 1600 um, to be shipped to Osaka Castle, but they were never used. Oh, wow. It looks like a sculpture, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now these are Hoshi's works, and Hoshi, would you like to read something uh, about what you do? Is that easier? And I can move uh, the clicker whenever you tell me to. Uh, yes. uh, this is my old works. Uh, yes. Uh, so you mentioned already. I was born and grew up in Japan, the island about art. I discovered that stone fit expressing myself. Uh, so. So I grew up in Nagoya, which is one of the largest, largest, largest cities in Japan. So in Japan, we can get granite uh, from many places. And also they import many kinds of stone from all over the world. Really? Mm -hmm. Yes, so it is easy to get any type of stones. Mm -hmm. So at first I, uh, I expressed myself uh, through using my different kinds of stones mm -hmm. to create a simple form. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in ex expressing about the complex city mm -hmm. uh, of the na uh, nature of things. In, in the what? Uh, nature nature of, of things, yes. Uh, 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 please. Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you see all the works too? Okay. Uh, uh, this one. Uh, this is me. This uh, is me. Yes. Uh, yes. After I moved to Sudan, May, my environment changed. Your environment changed. Yes. I live close to nature, and it is a country life. A country life. I, I, I want to just say here that that must have been a huge adjustment coming to white, rural <laughs> Maine. Yes. Was it? Is yes. it difficult? <laughs> I mean, I, I think good for you. Yes. And you, you, you managed so well, and you, you love living there, and you it has affected your work. And I like both uh, country and, and, and city. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's. So it is a country life. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of granite quarries mm -hmm. in our house, uh, and I basically use local stones. Yes. Now, uh, and okay. Ah, uh, this was uh, my old one. Old one. Yes. So recently, I have been working uh, working on my composition series. Your composition series. Series. Okay. Yeah. Which combines simple forms. Simple forms. We sing uh, one stone. Oh, using one stone. stone. 
I know you, you're challenged by doing very simple yes. uh, forms. I love the fact that you can read things into them. And they can, you can make them into whatever you want them to be as a viewer. So it is opposite, opposite method of my older works. It's the opposite method of your older yes, works. Yes, yes. Uh, but I noticed that in concept, concept it is the same direction. The same concept. Direction. The uh, same concept, direction? Same direction. Yeah. I noticed it. Okay. Um, you say carving stone is an exploration of time and self discovery. Do you feel that? Yeah. Because I made it. Uh, oh, your microphone. You need yeah, to put uh, I made uh, this tiny piece uh, on the Kitage Island this winter. Oh, this winter? You just yes. did that? Yes, wow. this is tiny piece. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the stone as well. This stone is from uh, North area of the stone. Uh, Yes, kind of basalt. Mm -hmm. This is from uh, oh, volcanic stone, mm -hmm. the base. Mm -hmm. Where is that, uh, uh, Hoshi? This is a uh, rope bluff state park. Rope rope bluff state park. It's wow. gorgeous. That's about. Ten feet tall, about six tons out of six uh, tons. Six tons. Well, yes. um, out of one piece of uh, Jonesboro granite, which is the neighboring town. Yeah. Did it? Yeah. When I uh, participated in the sculpture symposium, uh, school week, yes, two thousand one, two thousand eleven. And this is what you made at the symposium. Yes. Oh, really. That was quite fast, <laughs> really. Yes. So maybe, did you work this large before you met Jesse? I made, this was the biggest. This is the biggest, yeah. Okay. Uh, hmm. This is, this was uh, at Farnsworth Museum. At the Farnsworth. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, site Pacific. Uh, show a site specific show, yes. For in May, I was one of the artists. Mm, at very that time. And you say, My work is not the expression of an inner self, but more a way of opening myself. Oh. Yes, can you talk about that? You don't have to say anything, you don't want to. <laughs> I just think it's an interesting thought. You're opening up to whatever comes, comes to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I thought. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, here's Hoshi working on another beautiful sculpture. Yeah, this was uh, the symposium. This is the same one? Yes, in 2011. Uh -huh. So this is uh, in progress. Oh, wow. Uh, this last year, I finished this piece. Uh, title is Composition Trio. Composition Trio. Yes. What was the title of your symposium piece? Uh, the symposium the, piece was titled? Uh, warm Wind. What? Warm Wind. Warm Wind. Oh, yes. I love it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Because Rob Ruff State Park has Rob, a lot of uh, uh, strong wind. wind. <laughs> Great. So you uh, knew that it was going to be placed there, and that affected how you uh, thought of where did your ideas come from. When you're, how do you begin a work? Do you sketch it? Do you think about it? Um, I started thinking from mm -hmm. in my head. Mm -hmm. Then I'm doing warming up. <laughs> <laughs> Warming up yes. the thoughts about what you want it to look like, or or uh, what the form is. Uh, thinking in many ways. Mm -hmm. Then, when my idea is getting strong, mm -hmm. still hold in my head. You still hold it in your <laughs> head. Yes. Okay. Then, getting full, I start to draw. Mm -hmm. 
you start to draw. Yes. And what kind of time does that, that does it take months or is it weeks or is it days? Sometimes it's long, sometimes it's short. Sure. But when I was younger, I do all the time, uh -huh. a lot. Mm -hmm. Then when I used to draw, I realized I sometimes draw by hand. By hand. By, by hand? Uh, hand. Uh, by hand, you draw by hand. Technique. Like, I, I want to get to it over. Technique. Oh, you didn't want to use a technique. You just wanted to be freehand with your let it go where it wanted yes. to go? Yeah, I was drawing a lot and be there. Mm -hmm. Is there I guess I, instead of drawing, sometimes I can make up. Do you understand? I want, uh, I want to, uh, I don't want to make up. I want to keep. Mm, uh, my real voice. Your real voice. You want your real voice to come out through your hand. Mm. Not using technique. Mm. Mm. The, the Japanese um, schooling was very technique based. It was sort of um, rooted in what was taking place 150 years ago in France. And so to get into art school, she had to pass a cast drawing exam which would be like an eight hour rendering of a classic. So a lot of the Japanese people feel like they have too much technique mm. and it's hard to break away from that. Mm. I see, I see. So you are breaking away from that. Uh, this is a tiny piece too. Uh, I made it uh, two years ago. Two years uh, when ago. we went to uh, Kitagi Island, mm -hmm. uh, I made this piece. Mm -hmm. I just finished the installation yesterday. This uh, is the one that was installed <coughs> in the Ukraine uh, in, in Arno yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I installed at uh, inside the lobby of the the rec center in the uh, lobby of the rec center. Yes. Good. Yes. Uh, top top piece uh, is from China. It's from China. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As, actually, I studied uh, Kitagi Island. Uh -huh. I uh, I studied the beginning. In on the Kitagi Island. Mm -hmm. Yes, this uh, base is basalt from basalt. Uh, our land. From our your land? land. Yes. Uh, up in Steuben. <laughs> yes. So it's a nice combination. Yeah. That's, what, that's yours. That's what I'm on. Is this the beginning of mine? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Let me see. I'm going to go forward a little bit. Yeah, I guess this is the beginning. Okay, so we'll talk to Jesse now about some of his work. Um, Okay, this one is called what, Jesse? Uh, Torch Link. I don't know how you get that to bend like that and look like something that isn't stone. <laughs> uh, if you back up to the one before that, I didn't put that many um, progress photos in, but it would have been a square block, but then I split it to get this sort of twisted form. And then I carved these two windows that kind of pass through each other. And then I and then I take them apart and move them around into a into a, an arrangement. Jesse, <laughs> I don't know how you do this. You say transforming stone into art takes a great deal of calculation. It's mathematical and proportional as much as it is aesthetic, and it sure is. I don't know how you do it, or how you how you visualize it. Yeah, well, with the with the particularly with these ones, 
uh, where they have to pass through each other. And more and more, I, I make miniature pieces, and I have like a miniature set of splitting tools that I, and so it is, I can really figure out the proportions of everything, even the splits on a small scale. I see. It's really beautiful. How tall is this one? That's uh, 15 feet. So that, that's, uh, that was a, uh, I split that in the quarry, it was a seven ton block, and I waited until I got the right shape of the seam, and then split it so it had sort of a taper. This is called uh, torqued obelisk. So it's sort of like a, sort of architectural like an obelisk, but it's kind of like these two twisted frames. And so this too, I, I think the next photo shows how I, so that was the original block, and this is how I was saying I split, and, uh, I guess it's not in this photo, but, I had another photo, I had the, the model on top of it too. But I split so that the split goes and curves out part way through, and then I split from the other side so that it curves out halfway through. And then I do the opposite on the back side so it kind of comes out like this helix shape. Now how, you go and you find a stone, mm -hmm. and you have to look at that particular stone to see how it's going to split. Or, or do you, can you split it the way you want to? Yeah, from, any... from lots, lots of practice, I figured out, and that's why I do it on a smaller scale too. Yes. To get the proportions of the splits, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that the same thing? That's the same, yeah, standing it up the first time. Oh. So my, my father works for, with us, He's our crane operator, so the two of us. <laughs> now we have these headphones so we can talk back and forth. Hand <laughs> signaling. Oh my gosh. The equipment, Jesse. Talk about the equipment that it takes to move this stuff. How many tons is that? Uh, it was 14 <laughs> when, when I started, so um, I do have a commercial truck driver's license uh, so that I can transport my own material. And uh, I collect cranes. <laughs> this is my newer crane. This is from the mid '80s. My first crane was from 1950s, and I bought my first crane for two thousand five hundred dollars. <laughs> and the first day I had it, uh, it would have a fifty-foot boom, and uh, it was called a creeping boom. I was looking at something else, and the boom cracked all the way over the top of the crane and it flipped over and broke the trees behind me, <laughs> bent the boom over the top of the crane. <laughs> and I'd spent all my money buying it. <laughs> Is that why your father now drives the crane? <laughs> and did you build this uh, studio yep. yourself? Yeah, she helped. Um, we were still pulling stumps when she came on the scene. <laughs> but uh, we cut the trees down there and with that old cable crane that I fixed. We uh, built the, my father and I built the walls and sections and stood them up. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. It's fascinating because it's not just the <coughs> artwork, it's all the stuff that goes mm -hmm. with it. The, the machinery, yeah. the size of the building. How do you get these things moving around? Do you have a real? Yeah, that's what, I think that's part of the excitement of building them is figuring out how to do it. So I, I built this railroad with the, well they tore up the railroad in down East Maine to make the Sunrise Trail or something like that. <laughs> there were a few left over, so I got some railroad rails and uh, had these carriages that came with this old wire saw that um, I, I found that had been used to cut curbstones. So we can, I can put the pieces there and I can push them through my studio mm -hmm. and do different things to them, move them back outside. Uh, this was this uh, this was my largest commission, and that's actually the model for it, standing on the pieces that it will become. So the model is, uh, I guess, one inch equals a foot. So this was a memorial for people, uh, for fishermen lost at sea in Canada and Maine, and it's on the uh, Canadian-American border in, in Lubeck. Um, it's a beautiful sculpture. Is it the next photograph? Can we look at it? Or yeah, do you sure. still want to talk about this? Um, yeah, I've talked to this committee for three years 
before I got the job, and it took me a year to build it. Oh, where is it? No, this is, this is carving the, the pieces. My gosh, it's massive. I didn't put any of the rough stones, but each of these stones weighed about 30,000 pounds when, when I brought them to the studio, and they were just rough blocks. Where did you get the stones? These came from about 20 minutes from my house in uh, Jonesboro. You go shopping around for stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Looked out, yeah. And how do you get it to, the, to your studio? Well, it was a working quarry, so they had a loader, and then I had a truck and trailer, so I moved it back to my studio. And so that's after I chipped that away, I kind of carved it all smooth. And that in the back, you can see that's, you have to take the back wall out of the building to <laughs> that it add some more rails so that we could to get it in. Uh, well, they have enough room to cut them because they were like 14 feet long. Mm -hmm. So we pulled them through this diamond wire and cut, cut the see. faces. Oh. There's my father helping out. So that's what that rough block be begins to look like after it's all chipped away and carved down. What makes it so smooth? Um, <coughs> hundred chips or do you yeah, have something? There was a variety of textures. Like we did get this polishing, old polishing machine over there. We did polish some of the faces and then uh, flaked off the surface. I flaked off the surface with a torch to give it some texture to make it sort of look like a breaking wave because mm -hmm. the whole theme was waves. Mm -hmm. People lost at sea. <clears throat> so that's after I put the pieces together. So the larger one was uh, 17 feet long by seven feet tall, and it weighed, put back together, it weighed 15,000 pounds, it finished. It's hard to imagine, it's so big. And I epoxied them together, <laughs> so we could move them, move them in uh, one piece. There it is. So we, I also cut all of these paving stones, so that we had, so this was what I've been trying to go towards, and I'm trying to go in this direction now, is to have the sculpture be really a whole sort of piece of landscape architecture. Yes. So like this, uh, that's a, like a 20 foot curve that I split, which also holds the bank back. And then the walkways, and we, I installed solar lights. Um, and it has the name of, names of uh, 200 people that were lost at sea on the inside. So the names, you don't see the names from a distance, so you just get this cultural in, impact. But when you pass through it, um, it's sort of intimate with the with the names. Mm. I like that it's a whole environment, really. That's what you're working toward. Yeah. Mm. That was the dedication ceremony. Very cool. What are those things? Those black things to the right of the sculpture? Uh, instruments. So they were playing yeah. music. Yeah. Yeah, the um, Native American community that's just north of there had like a drumming ceremony for the dedication. Lovely. Uh, so this is getting towards the end of my slides, but this is the project that I'm working on this year. Uh, it'll probably be a five or six month project, and it's for uh, the Falmouth school system. And it's, uh, they had a sculpture competition and my project won. So this is the beginning of it. I found, I was looking for a boulder, like the shape of a giant egg. Um, so I found one in the blueberry barrens near where I live. And then I split it open. And I think the plan is uh, maybe the next slide coming up. So oh, yeah. that's what it looks like split open. And what are you gonna make? This this took uh, this took an hour to split, and it was it took me a week to move it back to my studio. <laughs> <laughs> an hour to split and a week to move it. <laughs> and so you had to dig it up out of there. Yeah, we had, well, we had to roll it. We had to move the crane there. We had to fix the road. Um, <laughs> yeah. So this is what it will be like. So the idea is I will. Uh, remove these tapered geometrical columns from each side, one side a hexagon and one side a triangle, and then I cut them up into five or six slices each that are about 10 inches thick, 
and then I'm going to build a 12 foot tall vertical sculpture that will be out of the pieces that get removed. I so see. you'll have this egg with these windows in it and that kind of hatch this geometrical oh. form. Of is it. this so, your, is this a study of it? What, what is it? Yeah, this is a three-dimensional rendering that I can move around and I can calculate the oh. different angles. You did this on the computer? Yeah. I see. Wow, Jesse. That's exciting. You won the, uh, the you, you proposed this and we, mm -hmm. oh boy, that's great. They had students on the committee, and it was like the math they were studying at the <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's good. So this is uh, from Kitabi Island. So since we've been married um, a little more than 10 years, uh, we've been going back to Japan and visiting Hoshi's family and visiting different kind of historical stone carving areas, and particularly the Inland Sea is really rich in stone carving history because of the castle building era. Um, a lot of the islands were quarries similar to the history of Maine, which is why I was really interested in it. So we um, had looked at potentially trying to find a studio on, on one of the islands. And the first island I looked at was really small. It, it, there were like 40 people living there. There's, there was no school? There was no school, no kids. There's no kids. Yeah. Oh, she said you could go, but you can go by yourself. <laughs> so we, we, I, I found a map of the different quarries for Osaka Castle, and I was checking out the islands and um, figured out, we thought there were still some working factories and quarries on this island. So we went there for the first time to live for a month with the kids, and we put them in the school. And uh, this is called... Um, vertical island. There's lots of these little islands like this. This is on the way to Kitagi Island. And there's there's two islands, one on, on each side of Kitagi. Mm -hmm. And one's called vertical and one's called horizontal. <laughs> and they look almost identical. <laughs> <laughs> How did the, the kids like living here? Well, there's definitely ups and downs. So this year we, we were there for two months. Um, so there's some really great things about it, and there's also some difficult things when we've been there longer. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot to explore. It's a pretty mountainous island. Will you go back next year? Yes, yes. yes. We, left, we left our tools there. Oh, you did? Yeah. It's your corporate headquarters in <laughs> Japan. <laughs> so this is a picture from maybe 80 years ago or so of Kitabi Island and then the white stone island next to it. So it was sort of a, a center for large architectural pieces. The largest uh, shrines in Japan had these tori gates, and these, um, these are like 40-ton blocks that would have become uh, pillars, mm. like legs of, of these gates for shrines. 80 years ago, so they had equipment that could move that stuff around mm -hmm. 80 years ago. Yeah. And this is what, what the section of the island where we work looks like now. So you have these kind of quarried cliffs in the background, mm -hmm. and then the rubble was used to build uh, this flat area, which is sort of like a factory row. And a number of them are abandoned or downsized. <clears throat> so the factory we worked in um, had only two people working in it, but we had a lot of space. Oh, I guess so. And where did you live, actually? Uh, we rent uh, someone's house. You rented a house? Yes. How many people live there now? On the island? Mm. 900. Mm. So the school is decent. Your kids went to the school. Yeah, there were six kids in the school. <laughs> so it's an aging population. <laughs> <laughs> they got a lot of attention. <laughs> this is what the old town look, looks like. There's, uh, in I, my theory about Kitagi, it was subdivided in 1600, so it was before anybody had a concept of a car. <laughs> so a lot of the roofs got close to touching, and <laughs> all the mail was delivered on motorcycle. <laughs> I put this in there because this, um, 
the native, the original religion of, of Japan before Buddhism and Christianity arrived was Shinto. And Shinto sort of has a god for everything. Um, Christianity has one god, Shinto has one god for everything. <laughs> and uh, so this is the god for stone workers. So I thought if we could have a studio in Japan, that we would want to have the, the, the god the for stone, stone workers, workers looking over you. And so you have to climb the mountain, and then there's this really cool rock. And the, the stone god lives in that little hut right up on top of it, oh, which gets opened once a year. Yep, there's like a little rope and you can climb up and then so that is just like, thing in there. That rock was just there. That's a natural rock, yeah. It looks like a sculpture, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. The way it's been eroded and stuff. Yeah, so around the island, I think, it, you know, 100 years ago and more, I think there was a whole. Um, Oh, there, were, there was harvesting of these natural features that would then go to temples. I photographed a lot of the temples that had these natural sculpted rocks from that they would have, you can't do it anymore, but they would have harvested them from the sea. This is one of the working quarries. That's there, you can see there's people standing up there for scale. And they wouldn't let me photograph it, but the way you get down in is you get in this this uh, grout bucket. That's what they move, it. <laughs> and then they swing you out over the quarry. And oh, right. Over the ladder. <laughs> well, I saw a ladder in one of them. You said this is the corporate ladder, the <laughs> <laughs> style. <laughs> so this this is the uh, factory where we worked. So. I mean, the other neat thing about Kitagi was um, it not only did it have its own stone, but it was such a manufacturing center that there were stones from all over the world. So there were, you know, there's abandoned quarries now that are just full of scraps of stones from. Anything from Maine? Uh, I found stuff from Vermont. <laughs> yeah. American Gray, it's called. Uh -huh. You can um, tell by just looking at it. Well, it says. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell about looking at it. Can you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite rock to work with? Um, well, I, uh, I don't know if I would have an, an exact favorite, but I do like the harder stones more than like the marbles or the sandstones. I like the colors and the textures that are possible with the harder stones. Which are? Which are granites and basalts and... Mm -hmm. um, what you grew up with in your area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you, Boshi? What's your favorite kind of stuff? Depending on my work. Depends on your the image that you want to make, you mean? Yes. And uh, depending on the situation. So now I live in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. I like to use local stone. I see. Yeah. So now you're using all local granite and basalt? Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is one of the so one of the things we do in Barankitani here everything kind of escalates in scale. Okay. There we're trying to make everything that we can send through the mail. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you have to like start with something you can pick up and then it has to get smaller than that. Um, so uh, so we think idea is big, but uh, plan the pieces small. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is like a modular piece that I can envision being 12 feet long and 7 feet tall, but right now it's 12 inches long and 6 inches tall. So you get a lot of research done when you're at Kentucky, and then you can come Try. home and build this right. huge from the model, really. Mm -hmm. But it's a finished model. Right. What do you do with these uh, sculptures? Can you uh, put these in, in a home? The yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah we do. We do sell the small ones mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh dear. Um, we well, can go back to that loop if you want. The what? The, the yeah. Um, that's a good thought, Gary. Can we go back to the um, oh. images that we had up at first? Then? And maybe you can talk a little bit about where they are, where we can see them, and then we will. If you have questions, we can. Okay, so this was the, this is good because this was the photo that was next to Hoshi's. Um, 
which she, was a small piece that she did on the Kentucky Island. Uh, East Cedar. Yeah, East Cedar. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this is at Portland Jetport. This is called Beach Pea, so it's sort of inspired by the rocky beaches of Maine and the fact that the beach peas always grow out of the rocks. And uh, so I split that outside shape and the natural bench uh, was what was split off from the side of it. So that bench is yours too. So you're building an environment here too. Right. Did you put all these rocks here? I didn't, no. They were there. Uh, this one's called Liquid Rock. So it was sort of like, I wanted to make something kind of like a, a lava lamp. Mm. And feel it's like very this, sensuous, yeah. the inside piece. So liquid rock is actually the, uh, the dictionary definition of lava or magma. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have this sort of twisted form, which I split, which kind of is like the energy of the earth creating the pressure and the inside is, could be like lava or stone shaped by water. And what do you call this? Liquid rock. Liquid rock. And where is it? This right now is um, exhibited at the uh, University of New England. Mm -hmm. China. Yeah, this is uh, on Ping Tan Island, which is the closest island to Taiwan in Fujian province, so southern China. Uh, so it was a large sculpture event that they did there. And you were participating and in it? And then did they buy this piece? Yeah, uh, so all of the works were built in China. Wow. There were, so we, we did our sculpture symposium in Maine for 10 years, and we, um, over 10 years, we did 34 pieces. In China, they did 40 pieces in one year. <laughs> so there were, I mean, um, more than 25 of the artists were stone artists, and then the rest were uh, metal artists. Metal. No. Yeah, from all over the world. Um, Jesse, talk about how you get these symposia going and what is involved in, in uh, having a symposium. Mm -hmm. um, well, so I got into the idea because I was traveling around working for other artists trying to learn as much as I could and I became an assistant at a sculpture symposium in Japan um, and I thought it was a great idea. So I, I tried to get, in the beginning of my career, I was sending out applications to be in symposiums, and then we planned our first uh, sculpture symposium um, uh, with the late Don Mazur, who was from right here in Round Pond. Uh, he, He's he, on the uh, rock solid. Uh, yeah. If you want to see a, a great little five minute uh, video, uh, we, we couldn't show it here, but it's called Rock Solid, and it's yeah. about Jesse's symposium. Yeah. And go ahead. Yep, and so when I was first starting out here, I, I met Don, and uh, he was an energetic person making sculpture all the time. Uh, I was telling him about the symposiums, he got excited about it. So we both went to New Zealand in 2004 and participated, and um, he had some connections here with Round Top, so they let us hold a two week symposium there. Wow. And uh, is there still sculpture around that was made at that? Uh, I think there's there may be one piece still uh, um, at Round Top, at Round Top. But it wasn't a public art symposium. We didn't have the budget for that. So after that experiment, um, I spent several. I, well, I went to Japan where I met Hoshi, and that was uh, a longer symposium that resulted in public art. Uh, so it resulted in a marriage, right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, so we. Um, together with a lot of local people in Down East area, um, spent several years fundraising and planning, and then held uh, five symposiums, one every other year. And I left some maps out there that people could take. Um, and we're also coming out- Maps of what? Maps what of the 34 pieces that were made in oh, 10 years. And the where they are. Yep. Okay, yeah, pick those up, they're out on the table. So they span uh, three counties, there's, um, First one from this direction is in Bucksport, and they go all the way to Lubeck and Eastport, and then uh, there's some in the Bangor, Orono area too. So this gets you to meet all kinds of different sculptors from all over the world. Right. And, uh, that's and there's, there's also, I um, have to mention too, there's 
uh, a symposium that's going to be happening this summer that's uh, not a version of SCUDIC, but more similar to what we started at Roundtop, although still more advanced than that, um, which is, is going to have uh, 13 artists. Um, and where is that going to be? That's going to be in uh, right here near in Booth Bay. Really? Yeah, at the Railway Museum. Oh, but, great. Yeah. And then uh, Dick Alden, who's involved with that, who's here tonight, he left some uh, pamphlets for that out there so as well. So these are what are the Booth Bay uh, Symposium. And when is that going to be? August. Yeah. The Symposium okay. itself, I think, is from the 11th to the, around the 20th. But there's a whole bunch of activities around it. And where will the people be from who are in this symposium? Uh, it's focused on main artists, but there will be one visiting artist from Japan. Yes. And are you going to be in it, Moshi? Uh, we'll see. Not this year. Not this year. Okay. okay. Um, let's go to the next one. Where are you here? So this was uh, oh, the sculpture that I made at our first symposium at Scudic. And this is the Rockefeller home yeah. that was turned into what? A, a it's now office space, but it wasn't used at the time. Um, we, we got involved with it right when it had been given uh, to the Park Service from the Navy. That was creative of you. <laughs> Is that how you got the symposium to come to? Us? Yeah, because we knew we had the space, the workspace and the lodging space too. Yeah, the workspace is big. It has to be big to have that many sculptures. Mm -hmm. That's the title room at, at the jet That's board. the one at the jet board that welcomes you to Maine. Yeah. This is this at the Farnsworth? It, this was at the Farnsworth yes, for a couple of years. This. It's now uh, near Philadelphia. But this is, uh, it's called um, Anatomy of a Boulder. And this was a, a 20 ton boulder that I split, uh, shaped entirely by splitting. I split the stone 500 times and then put it back together like a puzzle, minus some of the pieces. How do you hold the pieces in there so they don't fall out? This one is only held together by gravity. So when I move it, I have to take the whole thing apart, even the 50 pieces. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. How do you know a piece won't fall off and hit someone? Uh, when it's together, it doesn't. I, I kind of plan it out before I split it apart. <laughs> but the one, like, the one at the tidal room at the airport, mm -hmm. those were later than this. I drill through them before I split them apart, and then I bolt them together. Yeah. I can move it all as one piece. You know, this reminds me of pine trees. I love this piece. Just something about it looks like Maine to me. Uh, Here we are at this one. I did this piece last summer, so this is uh, kind of our Scudic sister symposium, which is called Sculpture St. John. So several years after we started Scudic, they um, took the idea with help from us and planned a similar event in downtown St. John, New Brunswick, uh, and. And so we, there's also maps out there of that, which include our sculptures. So if they do their symposium uh, for five, five symposia, it will make about 80 sculptures on both sides of the border. Wow. And this is an environment, too. You've got a seat here. Yeah, this was a, a large boulder, and I split it in half, and one side you can sit on, and there's actually like a, a, a place where they play music. And, and then this is sort of this, um, moon shaped piece. How much does the site influence what you make? Um, usually a fair amount. The, the symposium, this was very fast and we didn't have a lot of stone to, to uh, choose from, so I, I found sort of the largest boulder that had some length to it and then split it in half. So that had a, a lot of effect on it too is what was available for the material. This was the piece that I made at Round Top in 2004. Where is it now? It's in Harpswell, private collection. Private collection. Has Japanese art influenced your culture at all? Since you you're very you you were very interested in that culture uh, all yeah, along. I, I was really lucky to work. Um, at the Sculpture Symposium there. Uh, the art world has changed a lot in Japan since then too. Uh, I think I was studying hard stone sculpture at sort of the end of the 
hard stones culture boom in, in Japan. Um, and I think some of that was related to the stone industry in general, which has gone more to China and more importing things rather than domestic production. So it's affected the artists as well. Um, but Japan was a great place to study because there was sort of state of the art uh, technological tools, you know, the diamond tools, but there was also the long history of of splitting with uh, handmade wedges and um, the different surface textures. So it has a big influence on me. So you split with handmade, uh, mm -hmm. what are the wedges? Yeah, um, instead of drilling holes, I yeah. carved the holes. Okay, you put pegs and then hammer Yeah, them. a little flat wedge, mm -hmm. yeah. Must be very satisfying when it finally mm -hmm. splits apart. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Where is this one? This one is at the Farnsworth. Uh -huh. um, so this was one of the, the first ones in this series that I made. Um, and it's the largest one too. This is one of those that you look at and you wonder how you did it, you know, because it looks like you couldn't possibly move that piece inside the other piece. Yeah. And they're, they're four tons each to finish, so it was a challenge. How did you get it into the grounds without ruining the grounds? Over There's the a edge, story you know. that. <laughs> <laughs> did I bring up no, the source subject? No, we took the fence out and drove right in. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, you kind of have to. <laughs> so it's still there. For people to go this one's still yeah. there. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, go look because it's worth seeing and you can get right up and sit on it. You can sit yeah. on it. I think it says not to, but. Oh, <laughs> you can't sit on it, but you can look at it. Well, uh, maybe, Gary, we should turn the lights up and see if people have some questions. I'm sure there are questions. Here's one right here. Um, so, a few of us are docents at the Farnsworth, and we take school children around all the time, and they're fascinated by the links. And so did you say that it's it was one piece that you split and then carved it so it's the two links together? It's, it's hard to understand, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the question is, how is, are these pieces two pieces, that, and how do you get them to look like this? Yeah. Well, it starts out as one rectangular block, and of course it's easier to explain with uh, photos, but was, and then I cut one square window out of the middle of it. And then each of those links is sort of sitting on top of the other one. And so there's only, uh, there's a scene here and here. It's hard to explain without <laughs> photos. Even with photos, it's kind of hard. And then one gets split off from underneath the other one, and then they get moved around. How did you figure this out? I've never seen sculpture like that. Is this your unique thing? Um, yes, this is definitely my, I think I, I got into the idea of this because we had the wire, I had rebuilt this old wire saw, which made it possible to drill a hole through something and, and cut. So I was thinking of ways, the work I had done before that was all what I could split and then carve. And so I was interested in thinking of ways that I could do things that I couldn't do just with splitting or couldn't do just with wire cutting. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to combine splitting and cutting with the wire. You, you love to really split. Easy. That's that's mm -hmm. the main thing that you're passionate about, I think, right? Well, I, I, I love all aspects of it, but yeah. I do really like the splitting. Yeah. Other questions? This one back there. Yes, um, you talked about the splitting. It must be, or, or is it, Oh, good question. Um, well, it's a little bit of a combination because uh, in the beginning there were lots of surprises, but um, the, you can control the stone a lot. And it, I kind of took it on like scientific experiments. So when something did something that I wasn't expecting, I tried to like recreate it 
and then figure out what subtle differences would make it. So now I can, you know, I split things and they curve this way, but I can do it from the opposite direction to have it curve this way, so I can get these twisted shapes. A lot of those things started out as accidents, but they're not anymore. So usually I can get, you know, I can draw a line on the side of the stone, and, and even if it's, you know, it's curving like this, I, the line could be within a couple inches of, of the split that I get. So that's how I'm able to drill through pieces before I split them apart and then pin them back together. So it's a little bit of a combination, but you can never, one of the nice, the, the thrilling things about splitting is you never have 100% control of it. It can always surprise you a little bit, or yeah. you might realize there's some little factor that you didn't notice that becomes a big factor. <laughs> Hoshi, how about you with your work? If, if, do you ever have a case where you have thought of something in your mind, in your head, and you sketched it, and now you're starting to make it, and it comes out differently than what you had originally thought? I, I, I have a goal, but in progress, mm -hmm. sometimes not happening. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Mm -hmm. some struggling mm -hmm. but so sometimes some uh, uh, surprising happening many things but direction will be so direction is the same similarly toward that but yes but sometimes it changes a little bit or you get it back to where you you wanted it because once you're working with stone, you can't really put the stone back together, can you? <laughs> <laughs> so you're kind of on that path. Questions? Jesse, Here's one. I have a question. Have you ever been to Haystack on Deer Isle, which has a sculptor school there? Uh, yes, we've, we've stayed there a couple twice. <laughs> they don't have any stone coming. I have a son in in Australia who's a sculptor and he's going to spend three weeks up there at the end of this month. Wow, well. Second time. Oh, great. <laughs> great. So you can talk to Jesse about it. You've been there. You both have. Yes. yes. There's another question back there. Go ahead. Um, to get back to the, um, the sculpture there, I just wanted to ask. If you were to have to move that, how many pieces would it would it be um, taken apart? I mean, how many it doesn't come apart. It doesn't come apart. Doesn't come apart. No. So it would be moved just as it is. Yep. Yep. What I do is uh, I have two straps that come off the top, and two straps that go around the legs of the bottom piece that have to go up to the same height. And then I uh, screw on wooden bumpers on all of the edges. And then when it picks up, they kind of float a little bit within, but hit up against those bumpers to keep from chipping the sides. Oh. You had to figure all this out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, could you do some sort of small model that we could show children how that is done? Because I cannot get my head around it. Um, <laughs> We have to tell kids and Are make you in the room too? Yeah. yeah. But do you do you like the fact that people can't figure it out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I I I, I do uh, for the different variations I've made a model and I have to have it even for myself to figure out how to move it. Right. And the this one being one of the first ones that I did, I did do it on a smaller scale. I did it on a big scale right after. Uh, I was worried that that it wouldn't pass through itself. Right. Because it, it was really, you have to pick up one and then the other one has to hit the crane straps and you have to kind of lower it down like this. And then, and then you have to get it up and kind of turn it through and it didn't fit through. And I had to like recarve one edge right. to make it pass through. <laughs> if you drop one of those things off a crane, would it break? Yeah. Uh, Probably could, yeah. Yes. Jesse, um, has there ever been something you were trying to achieve where you didn't have a tool where you could accomplish that? Did you invent a tool? Or is there something you would like 
like to invent to work on stone? The question is, would you like to invent something to work on stone if you don't have the right tool for some specific job you're doing? Um, well, my father works with me most of the time, too. But we spend a lot of our time making the tools. And this project that I'm working on for, um, because it's so big, I had to make, make it a lot out of uh, recycled material. Like um, what? Well, just the, the, even the, the, just the steel. It's, it's really expensive from the yeah from like a salvage yard. I see. So hunt around for that, and then uh, find the bearing that of uh, a sluing bearing that would uh, turn it. And um, so now I have it so that I can turn it with a, a three quarter drive ratchet wrench, and it will, will turn it. In theory, I haven't put it on there yet. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll make little pullers so that we can pull this stuff. So you're a mechanical engineer as well as a Sculptor. By you trial have to and figure error. all this stuff out. What? By trial and error, certainly. We've, I've learned a lot. And uh, the splitting tools, um, they, they used to use very similar tools in the United States, but there's nobody that sells them anymore. So I learned uh, how to make them from an artist in Japan. And so now uh, the forging I do in the winter when it's cold because it produces a lot of heat. And I forge like a year's supply of the splitting tools. A year. A year supply because when you use them, they are ruined then? No, but they need to be uh, so that before there was uh, carbide, uh, use hardened steel. <laughs> so uh, um, every time they hired uh, five people to work in the quarry, they would hire one blacksmith to keep up with them. And so when I sh to sharpen a chisel, I actually have what's called a sharpener's hammer. It has like an angle, so if you hit it, it, go, it hits, makes the chisel the right angle. And uh, so when they get all dull, you don't sharpen them with a grinder. You put them back in the fire and crisp up all the edges and then harden them again. Oh, so it's a constant maintenance problem. Yeah, so they get they get a little bit smaller, but you're not making them yeah. from scratch each time. And what are you making them out of? Um, like a hard a carbon steel. Carbon steel. <laughs> yes. Have you ever been able to create together the same piece, or do you always work separate projects? Oh, wouldn't that be interesting? Have you ever been able to create a piece together? Together. Uh, <laughs> 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 Maybe someday. We talk about no. it. No. <laughs> yeah. It might be very interesting. Yeah. I mean, we the, we do, we help each other with stuff. I mean, particularly the. The moving of things is a, a, often a group effort. Um, but I mean, Hoshi has her designs and her way of doing things, and the decisions she makes are very different than the ones that I would make. So there has we to be a leader. We want to keep peace in the family. Yeah. Yeah. There has to be a leader with, with whoever piece is, it is. Uh -huh. I think it would be hard to have it be a, a communal piece. Maybe, yeah. Maybe that's why you can get along, because you're both doing separate things. Yeah. Here's another question. Same person. Uh, oh. When you're traveling down the coast of Maine, can you tell where you are by looking at the stone? <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. I did get this book, The Roadside Geology of Maine, one time. <laughs> and I actually looked up a number of the things to try to figure out what they were. Um, I'm probably not that knowledgeable. Um, I do know a little bit of, of, of geology because I'm so interested in it. Uh, and it does change a lot depending on where you are in Maine. Like different areas have different rock. Yeah, How like many if you, go, if you go to like the Old Town area, it's not that much granite or anything, but there's huge glacial moraines. Um, yeah. Hmm. Is the rock easier or more difficult to work with at this time of year and temperature? Or is it what it, it does? I think it affects it a little bit, but it's still consistent. Um, it, it would quite depend on the kind of rock that it is. If it's frozen to the ground, that will affect it. It would affect you too. I mean, if you're trying yeah. to split it. Okay. Yeah, it can affect the split if it's actually frozen to the ground. <laughs> the stone could be frozen and off the ground and it wouldn't affect it, but if it's frozen to the ground, it will. Mm -hmm. You work all through the winter? 
I have. I mean, I work now. We work indoors in the wintertime. Um, when I was before I had my studio, I often work, but it's really hard to work below 20 degrees. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, so why are you going to be happy in the winter?